Well, hello, hello. Welcome again. We're talking today about talent development, about being comfortable with yourself and being vulnerable, the power of that, how to do that. We're talking about delusion, self-delusion. We'll be talking about some of the things we're hearing the latest in work from home and the hybrid of work from home plus regular old work in the office. We'll talk about meeting in the middle. And we'll hit on the source of all our suffering. <laughs> all that and more coming up with Max Kozlowski and Daniel Marcos. Hi, hey everyone. I'm Bill Gallagher, scaling coach, host of the show. This show is all about how to scale and grow your business no matter what's happening in the world, the economy, your industry, et cetera. Um, we're interested in the things that transcend all of that. You can find hundreds and hundreds of episodes now on leadership and scaling up at scalingcoach.com. We've also got the downloads of all the tools that we talked about, our show notes from the comments of the speakers, their tools, their special offers, all that and more. We'll even send you a free copy of the book, Scaling Up, right there at scalingcoach.com. You just pay the shipping and handling. So scalingcoach.com is where to get it all. Listen in now to a great great conversation with Daniel Marcos, Max Kozlowski, um, as we get into the latest in the world of scaling up the things we're seeing in the world. Welcome, guys. Hey, Bill. Thank you for the invitation. So, the Matt, two guys in Texas. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's raining big time in Texas. I don't know if Max is it's in you, but here it's like... The sky oh, is it hard on you? Yeah. We have an amazingly beautiful, I'm just going to gloat about what an amazing day it is here. The sun is shining, like beautiful, perfect temperature. Yesterday, I was out with one of our business groups. We're actually three business groups. We did a, a sailing race um, between nice. three EO chapters <laughs> on the San Francisco Bay. And we took out all these boats and we had a bunch of skippers helping out. And we had a picnic lunch on one of the islands. And then we did a race on the San Francisco waterfront, which if you've never done before, is extremely intense, exhilarating wind for most people who are not used to sailing in that kind of way. Super, super fun. People are like, Do you have three EO chapters in San Francisco or in the Bay Area? We do now. We have, we've had for years the San Francisco chapter of which I joined 21 years ago, roughly. And, uh, and then we have a Silicon Valley chapter, a close relative. Now we've added a new chapter for the East Bay Area because we're a large geographic area with a lot of business. And I'm actually the incoming president for that chapter. Oh. Um, so right now, beginning my term next month. So I'm um, very excited about the year ahead. We've got tons of members. And of course, we're starting to do lots of things in person again. And uh, we did a few modified things last year. But this year is like, boom. So May on the Bay was our sailing event yesterday. Super fun. Super great. I should get out there doing some surfing uh, myself this weekend. So it's nice. not bad. You, you, you do the machine, uh, the the one with a with a motor, right? So I do like three kinds. I like the foil, which is a hydrofoil, rides up out of the water right. on a foil under the water. And I have one with a wing. I can yep. take it in surf, um, yep. just you know, standing in surf. And I also have another one with a motor on it for the no surf, no wind days, you know, when we just want to go. And in fact, I might take that one out either this morning or tomorrow morning when there's no wind and there's high tide and like that. So, so any, anything that moves, right. You're also an airplane pilot. If I remember. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But enough about me. What do you think about me? <laughs> <laughs> so you guys are in the rain we actually could use some rain here it's we're headed for a dry thing which is kind of terrifying because i think we could have some bad fires and smoke again before the summer's out so not in texas today since not i arrived like the, 10 days ago it's, huh? been, it's been raining consistently so uh, i i think it has to do with some of these uh changing uh, climate patterns right because it's it's been unusually wet uh we're we're happy but unusually wet but, yeah. but that's, that, that's what happens it's it just it's changing all the patterns that we have i was in toronto i live in toronto uh, still 
and um, the winter was really crazy winter. Like it was, it was hot until like end of January, and yes. then it got like desperately cold, like big, big time bad cold, and yes. then up again. That was it. Yes, but but it was well, really three weeks that was very uncomfortable. It seems up and down. We had uh, we had our sailing event yesterday. Christina Harbridge, who is one of yes. our friends and speakers and that kind of thing, came down to the event. She now lives in Lake Tahoe area. She said it was snowing as she left her house. <laughs> <laughs> she, and she's one of my favorite persons in the world. So uh, we're kicking off today's conversation with news. Uh, Mark Benioff says they may buy a ranch to try to create a, uh, like a next Crotonville. Salesforce CEO Mark Benioff talking about creating a physical place to gather people together, to develop people. I mean, this raises a couple of issues around just the investment in talent development and in coming together. Um, and, and also the value of like having a physical place, getting out of the office, not just in your training room, uh, but getting to another location to change the, the focus, the attention. Uh, one of the firms that is, uh, big on scaling up, uh, a private equity firm K1 uses a place that they don't own, Terranea Resort. I like to find regular resorts or places. We've done a number of sessions at the resort at Squaw Creek, one of the Tahoe resorts. We've got favorite kind of recurring places in Hawaii along the coast here in the Bay Area. Um, do you guys do stuff like that? How do how do you how do your teams work with getting off site and doing regular training beyond just their planning days, that kind of thing. So I, um, I still do a lot of planning sessions in Mexico, uh, Mexico city. It's, it's, uh, have a lot of clients there and there's a town called Valle de Bravo, uh, close to Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I do a lot of planning sessions there. There's a lot of hotels, golf course, a really big lake. And a lot of the wealthy people from Mexico have houses in Valle. So we usually go to two or three houses and then we rent a place in a hotel and do a lot of that. But I love the idea of getting out every quarter with yeah. your team. And, and by the way, I tell them the farther we can go from the office, the better. So yeah. even if it's like a two hour driving, it just changes the mentality. People are completely disconnected and not allowed to think. So I love when Benioff said this thing of the ranch. Um, just as a, an example at the Growth Institute, we don't have a physical office anymore. We used to have offices in Austin and Mexico City. Now we don't have an office, but we want to have a place where we could go and meet once yeah. a week or something just to have meetings and spaces. If we could have a ranch or a property that we could drive for yeah. half hour, an hour outside of the city and be able to meet there once a week or once every couple of weeks, that'll be perfect just for cultural things. But then the rest be home and work from home. So I, I think you want to, you want to do a few things, right? You want to you want to control the environment, um, eliminate distractions, and 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 give a treat, right, for for the people attending. Make it special. Make it make it something enjoyable. Because um, getting to be part of a, a retreat, getting to be part of a planning session is is a is is a, is a positive sign for, for for your career for the work that you do. So I think that uh, rewarding, uh, eliminating distractions. And then just the time of being together is is what's most powerful. If you can do it in a beautiful place, uh, uh, even even better. So we just did one. Um, uh, we've done a number like in backyards over the last year. Um, some CEOs backyard that we would use as a gathering place. We did one in a Airbnb location, a large, you know, good location with a like big living room. And we just did one though at a re Napa resort and we're starting to do these. I like indoor, outdoor. I like getting to a place that's a little bit away uh, and either a, a larger um, uh, like uh, rental property or a, a resort kind of thing where everybody can have their own room. But I think it makes a huge difference in, in uh, huge difference. if yeah. you just get out and kind of disconnect from the day to day. Uh, yeah. of the office. The thing is really important. 
We also did another uh, event recently with a group at a Bee Love um, farm near the Bay Area. It's a farm that was created as a as, as a retreat center for a restaurant group here, and it was kind of their built-in thing. And it's this really interesting, sustainable, organic farm. Um, and, and really cool. We did a, a group there and they have a lot of great meeting space. Uh, I'd like to create, I might have to build it if I can't find somebody else who's got one, a kind of an indoor outdoor space. A lot of windows, a lot of ability to open, get fresh air when the weather's right, uh, but have like a dedicated place where people, people could come in the Bay Area. We don't have that yet. If you've got a place like that, tell me. <laughs> I'm looking for one. <laughs> Well, I agree. Having a dedicated place like that will make a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. So we, w- what we did is we, we bought a house and used that for a lot of our trainings. So it has uh, a large training area, a conference room, and then, as you said, kind of the backyard. So, you, you know, after, when, you're, when you're feeling a little uh, droggy, you can just get people up and go outside and, Move you around. know, have a conversation yeah. standing up. Yeah. Uh, there's a shaded area. So, so that, that's helpful, but, um, mostly for people that are that, well, it's very convenient for people that are local, um, yeah. they can just drive up. It's only a few minutes away. Yeah. So, and I, you have that in San Antonio, Max? Near I do. Downtown, yes. Or where is it? What part of, of the city? It's, uh, five minutes away from the airport. Oh, <clears> so, you know, that awesome. in San Antonio, everything is close by. So yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's convenient. By the yeah, way, I have a couple have of friends. Over. I have a couple that is moving to San Antonio. Um, and they're now house hunting, and they said there's no houses. <laughs> Good luck with that. The only place worse right now, I think, is Austin. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I I was uh having breakfast earlier, and they told me something about that. I put the map in silo and said house for sale. Yes. No match. I was like, <laughs> what? So where we were, the typical silo, there was no match mm. of any house for sale, like mm. any price. Uh, before you used to have a hundred houses every time you open silo uh, for mm-hmm. sale, there was zero houses for sale. Well, a, a friend of mine put a bid for a house that was ten percent above asking price, and he didn't get it in San Antonio, in Austin, in Austin. Yeah, yeah. Austin. It's, it's it. crazy. Yeah. So, so where we are, homes are going for substantially more. Like the house on the corner just sold for half a million over asking. Over asking. Um, over asking, yeah. Um, as it's heated up in this area, right? And we thought years, 25 years ago when we bought our house, paying a little over asking, people said we were crazy. But today, paying a couple percent over is nothing. It's these ones that go, you know, a million over, half a million. You're like, okay, that's a wake-up call. How do you even do that? So one of my team members just recently moved to Philly, the uh, suburbs of Philly. Yes. He did 12 offers in 12 houses until he got one. Until he got and one. the one he got, he went above asking, 10, 15%. He got it. And while he was drafting the contract, they came back and said, or oh, you pay us 25000 or we don't sign the contract. Like, but you agreed. Don't care. And he was really mad. And I said, I get it. You're going to be mad for 15 minutes. But if you're going to use the house for 10 years, you don't, don't care. He went up. Yeah. So, then, so how long will this last? Not much. I'm sure. Well, this has been a trend for 25 years where we live. The going for over asking. California. California. It's a a lovely neighborhood and right. But 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 in in the US, like in in California, in Texas, you've never seen people bidding over asking price in Texas. It's it's just been. Well, we have had a lot of Californians wanting to move to Austin who. They've moved. They see it as being um, a decent place to live, kind of interesting place and not maybe as hostile to their politics as some of the other parts of Texas. Um, we've had a lot of that kind of go on and the taxes are a little nicer there, but for us, California. <laughs> and, and one or two other uh, uh, values and, and mindset differences. 
Yeah. You know, what I think about there are two things that we did to get our house years ago that were more subtle than the brute force of just raising our bid. Uh, one of them is we bid a thousand dollars more. So it was something one. Um, rather than an even number, just because if they somebody else guessed uh, and came in at the same exact number, we want to just be one off that. So we took it one up over the rounded the the even number, and then um, and then the other thing we did is we found a reasonable, credible excuse to have a direct contact with the seller. We actually bought it from a trust, a family trust, but there was a primary resident who was the controlling party. And uh, we came up with a, a legitimate, valid reason to want to talk to him about the history of the house and some of the details face to face. And that had him like us. Right. And, and our whole focus going to this. Yeah, we want to learn these things, but we really want him to want us to have the house to favor us. It's 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 interesting because even even in the retail environment, which which I would have not expected, we're, we're starting to see some some resistance in pricing. So mm-hmm. one, of, one of my clients is trying to buy a building and uh, you know, we, we, we matched the offer and they were second guessing it. Um, come to realize it, the owner had like a, a dream of what they wanted built there. So we had to go full marketing and uh, turn on our, our, our vision, our messaging, and, and convey what our vision for that space was going to be and how it was gonna have a positive impact in the community. And how it was services that were, were well needed, um, and uh, the jury's still out. We don't know if we're going to get it or not, but we definitely thought that we needed to go as you as you were alluding to, Bill, um, selling the vision, even when their hearts to- minds. Win their hearts, so, which is actually a good segue. Our next topic: uh, Elon Musk hosted SNL recently. And um, it's funny, I often watch the SNL program. Saturday Night Live, if you're listening out of the United States, is a weekly comedy, sketch comedy program. It's been on for many decades. And uh, Elon Musk was the host. You may have seen clips or heard about it. Um, I, I thought he was awkward as all hell, not a great performer, like that kind of thing. But he was so great about owning up to that saying like you know hey guess what i have asperger's hey uh guess what i'm i'm a weirdo like what did you expect i'm i'm like trying to create a multi-planetary species send people to mars on a rocket i'm transforming automotive you know internal combustion (laughs) it's like he's gonna be normal (laughs) yeah you you could not expect him to be normal after what he thinks and, and the way he does things Right, it was weirdly awkward. The presentation, yes. So, so is 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 anybody that achieves that level of success normal? Is is Jeff Bezos normal? Uh, Bill Gates normal? By the way, Bill Gates. Yeah, you know, we're, we're learning way more about that. Yeah, we're learning well, more and more Bill Gates every day. That maybe he did never want to get learned. I, you know, I wonder. If there isn't some power, I think there's a special power in sort of being able to own your weirdness, right? To lean into, to name it, to call it out. If somebody's being weird and then pry, pretending like they're not weird, it, it it's obvious to everyone and you feel it. I, I think it, it gets in the way. And yet we all try to like polish off the rough spots and right do all that to be more mainstream or more normal or that kind of thing it doesn't always work it's 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 interesting um remodeled my house recently was working with an architect and there was going to be a beam standing out right like a beam that wasn't part of the deal wasn't part of the plan so he gave us a couple of options of what we could do but one of the things was if you if you can't really put it away nicely then make it stand out right like paint it red make it a feature make it be part of the deal instead of doing a, a, a crappy job of trying to conceal it, which kind of yeah. goes along with that, right? So art and business, we see it combining all the time, right? It's, it's human psychology right. at the end of the day. Well, Pat Lynch, and he reminds us that vulnerability builds trust, right? Being willing to 
be vulnerable, to have the courage to say something, acknowledge something. Dave Rendell also talks to us about leaning into your weirdness and, and turning that into a superpower. I love that. Uh, you said get, get your biggest uh, weakness and convert it to a train. Uh, and and uh, I really believe that's the best way. Like the Elon Musk, right? He's super good in some things, but he's super awkward and he laughs about it. And he stuff. says dumb things that irritate people and that... <laughs> <laughs> By the way, but, but I, I do believe we're getting to, to an excess that he tweets and he moves Bitcoin 40%. Oh my God, yeah. It's, it's crazy that you get to get that power. I have a friend that is in the board of X Price with Pure Diamonds. Yes. Every time we have an X Prize, uh, a board meeting, the first yes. 20 minutes is just commenting what Elon Musk just did. And then we get into the meeting. <laughs> but but the, every time we meet, there's all these tweets and things that he did, and we all have to comment about them. And then we start the board meeting. Well, like, yeah. Well, well, he is clearly disruptive, right? I think there's a uh, something useful to name here. So, like, I know, and you guys probably know certain things about you. And when I'm coaching, when I'm speaking, when I'm working with people, I know that I am verbally dominant, that I just fill the silence too much. I know that I tend to cut people off. I start speaking, I hear something and I lean in. They're not even done talking. And I'm not even very conscious about it when I do it. I know that, I'm sure I've done it here already. I know that my uh, verbalization, my persuasion occurs as manipulation. And, you know, I don't, I don't like those things. I, you know, I wish I didn't do them, but I, I know where they come from, that kind of thing. So mostly I just say, oh, I'm sorry, I cut you off. I do that all the time. I'm sure that I'm going to do it again. I cannot promise that I'll never do it again. I'll try not to, uh, but for sure it's going to happen again. And simply like saying that, like I have this problem, I do this thing, um, is so used. People are like, wow, like you just owned that, you know? Um, and I think when coaching people, I try to get them to own their random weird shit. <laughs> so I, I, I like that that approach because it it, disar it disarms the meaning that your actions could have to them, right? Yeah. So for example, if you cut someone off, they might feel it's disrespectful. So they might get angry and disengage versus you're letting them know that it's not them, it's you. So you're taking all the meaning and all the energy out of that possibly negative situation. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful strategy to, to recognize it. And and also um, the empathy that it creates, right? Look, I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. Let's be honest with each other because yeah. that's how we can help you best. And that's how we can, we can make this work. So before I start coaching a company, I try to interview the CEO and a couple of other team members. And I say, the more I know of all the weird things happening, the more I'm going to be able to help. And at yeah. the beginning, they were like, no, I'm afraid or hope that that doesn't come out. And I was like, it's going to come out. Um, one of the things that I like about scaling up, as an example, we make everything float, the good and the bad. And a lot of things stink. The earlier that I'm able to identify them, the better. So Max, yeah. what you're saying is true. If we could have that conversation at the beginning, make things way easier after. And, you know, I think we're afraid of hearing those things and we're embarrassed by them. As a coach, you probably want to help people to access them. Like, you know, if I got caught being persuasive and got called out as being manipulative or whatever, I would be embarrassed and I and I and I would apologize and it'd be awkward and then it'd create this whole thing. And when I learned to, but but by virtue of having a coach to say, oh, yeah, it's just kind of how I am sometimes. I, it's not personal. <laughs> <laughs> like, that like changed, you know, everything. So I, I, I think that a lot of, um, you know, like being comfortable with your weirdness comes with a level of maturity that comes from feeling that, you know, you're not going to die broken alone, if, even if you're not perfect. Right. So yeah. uh, I believe that humans are under evolved species and we still act on some of our basic instincts, right? Survival. So we don't want to lose love because that means uh, we're going to lose support and that means we're going to die broken alone. 
And I think that we try to conceal these weaknesses as to uh, not lose that love, that bond, that uh, community. And I, you know, we've, I think we've, we've all heard this idea that some people would rather be right than happy. And, 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 and the thought in, you know, with our time, with our teams is it doesn't matter who's right. It, it's about getting it right. Right. Yeah. And it doesn't matter who got it wrong or failed. It's about what we learned from that. But being able to, to, to overcome that anxiety of, um, you know, losing, losing the love, which means all of these other things happen is, is a critical point. And that's why making it a safe environment and, you know, uh, uh, what, what, what Daniel says with what Bill says, I think it's so powerful because you're really saying, you know, we're not perfect, but together we can figure this out. Well, Elon's uh, business namesake, Nikola Tesla, definitely died broken alone. <laughs> it can happen, right? If you uh, don't have a coach, if you'd like a coach to help you uh, kind of get in touch with your whatever it is, um, or uh, help your whole team to level up this thing and work better together and to recognize themselves and all that. Our coaches, uh, all three of us are coaches, but we have nearly 200 coaches now around the world. So there's a coach in your neighborhood or with your style or with the background or whatever you want. But in, in the world of scaling of coaches focused on business growth who, who use the scaling up framework, we've got nearly 200. If you'd like to find a coach, in your area, of course, you can get in touch with all of us. We'll put our links up uh, before the end of the show and in the show notes here. But uh, you can just drop us an email, info at scalingcoach.com, and we'll say, oh, here's one in Miami that you could work with, or here's somebody who uh, specializes in this area or that kind of thing. So we're happy to help you find it. Most of us stay pretty busy all the time, but finding an opening for one company with one of the coaches is uh, is definitely possible. So if you don't have somebody, if you haven't worked with some, you owe it to yourself to um, at least experience a little bit of having a coach. Nobody gets great without a coach uh, at some point. Um, our uh, next up is uh, Adam Grant's TED Talk, um, Think Again. Um, so there's a link. We'll put the link in the show notes as well to a TED Talk that that um, that I watched recently with Adam Grant, which I think is just brilliant, about the, the booby trap of being too smart, of thinking that you're not biased, of thinking your way through things and get getting so bogged down in just being too like too too cerebral too <laughs> in your own head about things right with your own perspective and and that's uh it's similar to uh least wise man rookie smarts um mm. if you come thinking that you're a rookie uh you're going to yeah. be open to ask questions and learn and, and get better if you think you're the most intelligent person in the room you're done it, there's yeah. nothing else you can do so there's 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 this idea that just blows my mind and we are, we are terrible at self-evaluation, right? We're just terrible at self-evaluation of our, of our skills. Whether, you know, whether you're a speaker, you might think you're worse than you really are or better than you really are or a, or a writer or a tennis player or whatever that might be. So to me, it is critical that you get professional eyes on you to give you a, 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 a real and unbiased feedback of where you really stand so that you can really improve, right? So if you surround yourselves with a bunch of people that are just uh, the equivalent of, yes, man, yeah, you're doing great. You're awesome. Well done. How, how are you going to figure out what you really need to work on? Yeah. If you're hanging out with a bunch of your, your high school friends and they are all like, you're suck, you're terrible. Uh, it's not going to work. That doesn't do it either. Right. What high school did you go to? <laughs> <laughs> so, so exactly. You, you need, you need someone you can trust that knows whatever you want to get better at and can, and can really provide you some real feedback because again, it's, it's just amazing how bad we are at self assessment. So Adam in, in the video there talks about how going around in our own head with our own thinking, we're not biased and, and trying to think our way out of the box. Uh, one of the things that we do again and again is staying the course on bad decisions. So we've invested something, it's not working, we keep investing, we keep noodling on it. And there's a difference between like knowing when to adjust and 
when to quit and when not to quit. And sometimes we think just don't quit and something good will happen. But if you don't quit, you keep doing the same things that aren't working. That's just crazy, right? But something that every last one of us does again and again. <laughs> yeah, so, 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 so the idea of sunk cost bias, right? And in, in, in some of the values and beliefs that we've inherited from our parents and grandparents, right? Um, winners never give up, right? You, you see things all the way through. We, so we buy into this mindset versus at any given time looking at the situation and making an assessment of what's the best move right now regardless of what has happened before. Yeah. So and maybe you know, I mean, you're getting yeah. out or at least adjusting your approach. I believe Absolutely. whenever you believe there's just one option, you're wrong. Uh, uh, that's for me what it allows you to see more than one option. Um, and it's happening politically. This is the only party that has the truth. No, all political parties are destroyed and they do some things good, do something bad. You have to align to the one that gives more of the right answers according to you, but they have, and oh, they all have good people and they have bad people. It's the same. So for me, that's what that gave me. More uh, options, yeah. More options. If you think that there's just one option or you are the only option, you're done. So that's a great actually opening to talk about two things. You've got a course with uh, on the Growth Institute, don't you, Daniel, with Kai Han Krippendorf? Uh, on strategy, Outthinker. Outthinker yeah. competition. Brilliant. Yeah. So Outthinker really talks about getting additional courses of action. The other one is our workshops. If you do uh, one of our public workshops versus a private coaching session, you will hear from other companies and the things that they're doing. And very often the approaches taken by other people in other industries can give insight and fresh ideas to things that you might try in your industries. If you come into one of our workshops with an open mind, um, you will get a great, uh, great deal of benefit from that. Um, we have a two-day deep dive masterclass workshop coming up July 1920. Um, if you'd like to do it, uh, we will offer um, a variety of like um, pricing levels. So individual team and then absolutely free. If you want to be in the workshop for free, uh, you can observe only in a private Facebook group and we'll have that July 1920. And then, of course, um, there's a fee if you do it live and interactive in our Zoom session. Um, we also include some private coaching with that workshop. You can do all of that. Um, just send us an email uh, to get into that. Uh, thing if you're interested, info at scalingcoach.com. Again, the same email, July 1920. Do you guys have workshops uh, or events coming up? To, uh, uh, um, to we have uh, at Growth Institute, we do the online master business courses, the three months. Yes, all and the that's time. What, that's when people say uh, they really like, said, hey, the videos with yeah. Vernon are amazing. The coaching yeah. calls give us a, all this guidance with a coach. But the mastermind, the discussions with other members, it just blew things away. Indeed, I like to tell a story. There was a lady that took our MBD program mm -hmm. and she joined. And the, the next MBD is the Master Business yeah. Dynamics yeah. Right. multi month course. It's like an MBA, but for operating scaling companies. That's correct. Thank you for that. Um, so when she joined, we, we gave her access to this WhatsApp group with all the other MBDs. Yes. And she was waiting for her class to start like in a month and a half or two months. And she got into the group and she was seeing all these people having discussions about things in their business. And she said, yeah. hey guys, I've been having this issue that I've been able to fix for the last two years. Does yes. someone have an idea how to do it? And yes. two of the other CEOs said, private <clears throat> message me, I know exactly yeah. how to fix it. And nice. she took two calls with two different CEOs taking the MBD and she sold yeah. it. So she emailed me two weeks after she paid and said, the whole MBD was paid. I already fixed this big problem that was costing me hundreds of thousands of dollars. Wow. And it was fixed by other two CEOs in your group. By just having a community of committed people in the same, yeah, really great. And that's that's one of the things that I really like about what what we do and the way that we do it, because we build both, right? We 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 are following a, a proven system with tools, with methodologies, uh, with with a thinking criteria, and we build communities. So you get the both, the best of both worlds. So you know, some some sometimes that, as Daniel was alluding to, is. is more powerful than the tool itself, but without the tool, the framework in the direction, um, then then you're not 
you know, moving, moving clearly towards specific goals. So I, I really appreciate the combination of, of, of the two pieces that, that you guys are all working on. By the way, we've begun to offer um, one of your courses, Daniel, the Masterclass in Scaling Up. Um, if you want to take that self-paced thing, it's uh, it's largely led by Vern uh, Harnish there, and you can go through all the modules. We're combining that with coaching now. Um, our our low end for that is $5,000. So for just that, you can get some private coaching plus that self-paced course for yourself as the CEO of the company and, and start to get your company down the path of scaling up. Really. We, we get a lot of coaches uh, purchasing that for their clients because yes. that's, that's the only way to get burned directly, uh, let's yeah. say, teaching. And we have, he has over nine hours of earn teaching every piece of scaling up. Um, so it's a great add-on to coaching. Uh, indeed, every right. time I do a private implementation, I usually send what we call a champion, that it's the, the master practitioner who's in charge of helping me implement internally. We usually yeah. send that person to go to the full master business course because of all the community, the videos the and the rest. Right. And they help me implement scaling up in the company. Oh, nice. Nice, nice. I nice. always do that. Yeah. Well, we haven't done as much of that, but we're just starting to do it now because we've seen so many people want a self-paced approach um, and they want um, they want to do it in their own time frame and they want a mix of the private coaching plus the online learning, which I think is really great. Correct. This whole notion of work from anywhere at your time. The last year we saw the WFH work from home, right? Um, and uh, that accelerated something that's uh, been brewing for a long time. Atlassian's just updated their policy and planning to do that. We've seen a lot of our teams have a mix of that. I think uh, people are going to be navigating this for a little while. What uh, what are you hearing from the companies that you're working with on work from home, work in the office, or the hybrid of the two? How, how's that conversation going? You want Starbucks? Sure. So it's it's very interesting because the, the pandemic forced people to, to, to even give the work from home a, a shot, right? Like it was not an option. And what I've seen is, is like a mindset shift from... Uh, a typical, no, everybody comes to the office because we need to see humans in the office to a, this is not too bad, is it? To a, well, it's more convenient. So it, it's, it's a very cultural thing, I believe, right? Um, and I think that we still haven't figured it out fully. So I think that the most, you know, some of the more progressive um, uh, uh, people that I work with are trying to figure it out as we speak, and they understand the value of giving people some freedom, some accountability, and some face time, and and trying to combine all of them um, to get kind of the best of both worlds, right? So Silicon Valley and companies in Silicon Valley have been doing it for for years. Um, with what I hear, um, less than stellar results in some ways because for some people just can handle the responsibility of working from home, getting their work done, showing up when they have to and being engaged. And some people struggle with it. So I think that that um, companies are going to have to figure out what model they want to do and, and who, are the, who, who are they going to need or what skills they're going to need to develop to be able to, to accommodate the, that, that vision. Mm -hmm. So for me, I, uh, I'll tell you first growth is what we're doing and then what I'm hearing a lot of my clients yeah. Uh, at the Growth Institute, we decided we're not going to have an office, but we're looking for a place that we could go there one day a week in Mexico mm -hmm. and Austin. So we said, hey, Tuesdays, everyone goes to the office and we'll have all our internal meetings, everything. Like co working space or something. That's it, a co working space. Yeah. But yeah, we're looking yeah. for a co working that will allow us to pay just for one day instead of the five days. Uh -huh. And everyone will take home their stuff. We have a warehouse, so we have all the physical stuff uh, yeah. in a very located in Austin and uh, pre-central location, Austin and um, and Mexico City. And then the idea is to go to a co-location for once a week. Um, I have, uh, by the way, but our business is very, very uh, virtual, so we could work virtually very, very easy. Um, I have a lot of my clients that have a lot of their work is physical. And what they're doing is the team members that are able to be self-managed 
they could work from home three days and go to the office two days. Yes. The ones that do not, or they have uh, poor results being home, they have to go to the office four days a week uh, yeah. or three days a week. So yeah. if you want to be home more, great. You have to raise your productivity. So now they're playing with a KPIs and, and said, hey, if your KPIs are above this and they're green, you could work from home. If your KPIs are below, yellow or red, you have to come to the office. So yeah. it's been a great way to get people to be more productive and focus on results, not on hours. Um, so I think, by the way, this pandemic just accelerated something that it was already happening, but it just made us figure out um, than before. And I, I always tell the story. We've been doing online education for nine years, almost 10. And I've told my clients, hey, these courses were great. And they said, I don't care. I'll pay you three times more. But you fly to my office and you do it here. And I was like, but online is better. You're going to do bite-side pieces in three months instead of two days. I don't care. I'll pay you. You come here. And now they have to go online. And they call me and said, this thing is great online. And I was like, I've been telling you for nine years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah I really. think because of what happened, we had to get used to doing it uh, online and figuring out how to do things remote. So I don't think we're going to go back to the typical big buildings in downtown cities. And I think it's going to be very, very hard that we go full to that. Um, I think we're going to still keep offices, but it's going to be a mix of home and home office. And by the way, that's why going back to the housing issue that we're seeing, people are buying bigger houses. Uh, people used to live with two or three roommates. Now they want less roommates so they could use a room as an office um, and all those kinds of things where we had to invest in building that. So now that you have that, you don't want to go back to the office and go two right. hours in traffic a day. So right. I really believe we're going to have to figure out a balance. And the balance is going to be determined based on your productivity and your age. The millennials in their 20s, they want to go to an office and have fun and all those kind of things. For me, that I have kids and it's two hours more with my kids. I could have lunch with them every day. No way. I'm not going to go to the office. So, so I noticed that um, companies have discovered that they could recruit more widely by having the work from home, the remote work. So they could, instead of being limited to people in the Bay Area to come to the Bay Area or whatever, or wherever it is, they could recruit all across the US and all over the world. Now they're like, oh, I could hire a developer in New Zealand or I could hire, some, you know, wherever. So they could find people in different places. And that also then changes the competitive uh, nature of the salary and the cost. So it untethers a little bit from the realities of living in certain places, uh, which works for some jobs. Uh, and that's been useful. And in, in a number of our companies now, they have a core office and core team that's now managing blended. But there are some people who have been recruited now in other parts of the country and world that are never going to move uh, or unlikely to ever move. And uh, and those people will operate remotely. So you have some people working from home locally, some people working from home remotely, and then from time to time wanting to actually get together. So we just did this meeting up in Napa with one of our teams uh, that is more remote. The first meeting where people flew in from places for a meeting. We've done some other meetings like in a CEO's backyard this last year, but this one, people flew in for a meeting in Napa and uh, there was some time for the strategic thinking group to meet and then some time to work on an acquisition. Um, and that was really great, but those are people who all work in different cities and states um, and different parts of the world, right? So that is, I think, beginning. Of course, there's still restrictions on some of our international travel, but with vaccines and that kind of thing, that's going to change rapidly soon. Um, but as an yeah. example, in, in at the Growth Institute, we <clears throat> went remote and we had a huge saving for being remote. But yes. the team is being saying, hey, want to be together, blah, blah. So we put a really big goal uh, at the end of the year. We had an amazing last year because yeah. everything went remote. We've been online. Yeah. <laughs> so we told people, if we get to our number, we're going to go to the beach in Akumal, uh, south of Cancun. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we're going to go for a week, all the office. Yeah. Yeah. So in the summer, we're going to get yeah. all the team for seven days in the beach. And yeah. 
everything we save in office, whatever, we're going to spend probably 20 or 30% of that and go yeah. for a week, fly everyone to the beach. We're going to do a lot of work uh, yeah. there, uh, a lot of planning and the rest. We're also going to have a lot of fun as a team. And that's going back to uh, Salesforce, uh, Mark Vineyard, saying we need a ranch. You have, you need that space to go and have these retreats and just have fun for the cultural part. So whenever we're working home, we, that will last you for several months and then you have to see each other again. But if you're not as big as a sales force, you maybe aren't going to have your own dedicated space that you have to own and manage. And we have spaces now like this in the coaching community. So you could do a multi-party retreat in Akumal. Um, I've got a friend with a group of houses on the beach uh, in Costa Rica that are perfect for a retreat. Um, we, we have a place where we do regular, um, retreats in, uh, Marathon, Florida, um, uh, down there, uh, that's fantastic and really well set up. Um, uh, Vern's got a place, um, that he likes to use in Boulder. Um, I, uh, we've got the, the resort in Lake Tahoe. So we have a lot of locations to suggest to people that are perfect for doing your offsite, for your learning, for giving the team a little uh, experience and connection time as well. Let, let me let me go back for just a second on, on this idea of, uh, you know, re- remote work and how what's going to happen. And it kind of reminds me of the early days of television uh, and, and television commercials. So the first television commercials no, were... No. I'm sorry? <laughs> well, you said it reminds you. I said you don't look that old. Well, I, I, I used to work for, for consumer packaged goods, so I, yeah. I, you know, spent some time on that. But the early television commercials were a bunch of people reading scripts like they would for radio, but with yeah. a camera in front of them. They, mm-hmm. they, 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 there was like a new technology, and they just didn't know what to do with it, right? right. Later, they discovered that you could tell these marvelous stories in, in 30 seconds, right? Exactly. And create movies, yeah. et, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So I believe that we're kind of like that right now. We're still trying to do the same type of um, work, but with, with, with new technology. And the technology will continue to evolve. So I think that we're going to evolve how we even look at meetings, how we uh, look at communication, how we look at interaction. So instead of, again, just trying to do the same thing, but now virtual, I think we're going to come up with, with different dynamics and activities um, that only uh, through technology could be done, right? Mm, so, mm, mm. so Daniel, I, I, I saw a post that you um, gave a workshop on VR. Yes, I gave a right? workshop on VR. Uh, Alt, Alt, um, Alt VR, it's a platform in, in Oculus. Uh, and I was with my Oculus here in my desk. And I upload the presentation. And I had my hands controls. And I was flipping the slides in Alt. And it was... Right. It was a lot of fun. It was weird and clunky. And it's weird because like you had to change these settings that if I'm talking, I want everyone in the room to hear me. But if I'm talking to one person, I have to lower the volume so they will just hear me. So that, they're even figured out in, in AR. And it was really weird because people were, were talking to each other and I could see them moving and talking and I could hear them. And it's weird um, because they don't believe you could hear them. And they're yeah. moving and talking and bumping around in the in the stage, and I was like, guys, this is distracting. <laughs> but we're not used to. It. We're just getting it used. To it. By the way, you have to do a VR presentation. It's it's going to be the future. We know it's going to get there. Today is clunky and weird, but works. Now you have a space and you could flip slides and everything uh, on a virtual space. Wow. Very, very I cool. have not done that yet. So it's very cool. It's very worth it. So no, now we good. have EO chapters doing it uh, all over the world. Um, I've, I've had five or six year chapters that I've heard they've done it. Um, yeah. Bill, I'll help you. I'll introduce you to the uh, company. We hired a company in Poland thing or somewhere in Europe. Yeah. And it was not that expensive. They, they set up everything, send, uh, uh, invitations to everyone and they manage it. And it was great. Right. So, so, so great example of, of, of new technology and how we have to first figure out what's out there, how to use it, how to get value from it and, 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 and really create the future. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. We used to do this sh- as an audio show once a week. And we did that for a number of years. It was great. And it was building an audience. And then uh, and then when the pandemic hit, 
one of the first things that we did was begin to increase the tempo. So we started doing more of them. And then we started doing them live and we started adding video to them. So now where before video was the exception, now video is the norm. And we have, we still have more listeners than we do viewers, a lot more, but we have a tremendous uh, potential now to do, to reach more people and, and, and get our content out in, in more ways with the video and added this whole other dimension, which was part of that multi-year thought that we would we would develop video at some point, right? So cameras got better, mics got better, the lighting in the office got better. My office became a little mini TV studio. Um, Daniel's begun to upgrade his. I see Max, you're working on yours, but we all got better at these things. And I think well, this is gonna be my homework this tonight. How to <laughs> set this. Uh, I've, got, yeah. I've got the studio where we deliver workshops with several cameras and angles, yeah. um, yes. you know, and toys, because doing a presentation with a talking head is not quite right uh, as, as fun as the movement and the interaction. And, right. and uh, I know you use like Stream Deck and stuff like that to pop in and out and change sizes and make it more dynamic. And without this situation, I would have probably never gotten into figuring that out. I co-led a, a big workshop last week with Vern. We had 550 people registered. Daniel was in it for a bit and that kind of thing. And, and for those, we're using um, multiple studio locations, guests coming in from different places. We're putting slides as our background with video and animations in the background. We're bringing in music as well to the whole thing. So it's highly interactive. I, and I think... Well, you may expect your coach and speaker presenters to have done that. I think it's a mistake that more CEOs haven't gotten better at this. If you're a CEO speaking to, interacting, leading meetings, addressing a growing company, and you haven't figured out to keep the light source in front of your face, to turn off the distractions, to close the door, to get a better microphone, um, to master some of these basics that you will see people who are doing speaking and coaching that kind of thing remotely do it, you're making a mistake. You you should be doing that same kind of thing that you see us doing here. Uh, you might not, like I now, the, I'm talking into a teleprompter right now. It's not scrolling words like a news person would do. It's got the Zoom window on it, but it ha allows me to have eye contact pretty close to on most of the time, right? Um, you maybe don't need to go quite that far, but learning to talk into the camera, getting your basic lighting right, improving your audio, um, and and not try, like, this isn't going away. Even as we go back to the office, this needing to be facile and capable and expert, a good speaker in this environment is is with us. If you're a leader of a business, even not the CEO, any C-suite, you ought to get good at this. Um, it'll make a big difference. As you were saying, you can make it more fun, right? Because at the end of the day, we all want to be entertained. We want to have a good time. We want to learn, but we want to have a good time. So uh, what are you talking about? <laughs> there we go. Exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> uh, no. Right? Being silly, being playful, right. having some room for it, right? Uh, yeah. By the way, Bill, I already got this. Give me one second. You're going to love it. Yeah. What do you got? Probably one of the new, new tech toys. There we go. Got Elmo also. <laughs> Actually, and Elmo comes from our mutual friend, right? I learned Elmo from Rich Manders, another one of our coaches. Um, Elmo stands for enough. Let's move on. <laughs> so when, when you have a discussion, instead of just being yes. rude and interrupt, just share your Elmo. You're out. We just started, and I, I'll have somebody going on a little bit, and I'll just start to go like this. <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening, I'm uh, bringing Elmo just into the corners of the visual of the video frame. <laughs> and it, it really breaks the discussion in a very playful, simple, playful yeah. way. And you're not rude. So we have to learn all these things uh, to be able to have better meetings. Speaking of playful and humor intact, Tyler Perry gave a talk, billionaire, entrepreneur, entertainer. Tyler Perry has always been a little bit different. And uh, he spoke in the Oscars giving uh, a great speech and, and highlighting about refusing to judge and hate people and inviting everyone to meet in the middle. And uh, certainly 
a lot of the media for the last bit has inflamed things by taking extreme positions, by bait and switch, by spreading innuendo and misleading things and has pulled us apart. And as we work from home, I think it's probably useful for us to think about how and where to connect, where to find a place of common agreement, common perspective. Yeah. It's it's challenging, right? Because everybody's fighting for 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 our attention. And and somebody can quote me on this one, but but I think that, you know, like 40 years ago, 30 years ago, we saw uh, you know, like 3,000 messages a week. And now we see like 30,000 or 300,000 messages a, a, a day, right? So the amount of brands and messaging vowing for our attention is, is completely overwhelming. So the only way to get our, 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 our brains to stop and recognize something is if there's a threat response, mm-hmm. right? Because we were, we're, we're built for that. So, you know, I think it's going to get worse and worse. The more, the, more, the more brands are vowing for our attention, the more uh, products and services are out there, the more we get bombarded the more extreme they have to get to get our attention. And they pull us to one side or the other because they, they, they need to have this, this again, this, this um, uh, survival response, this fear response. So that's, that's when it comes to the media, my, one of my biggest concerns because I don't see it getting better because yeah. otherwise nobody cares, right? You don't, you don't get the attention. So I, I find that idea of, of meaning in the middle to be really, really challenging because it kind of goes against human nature. And, and, and um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how that could be fixed because I haven't figured out uh, a solution for that. I, I feel like it's a personal inventory that like we, it, the media isn't going to go change or transform or suddenly like do anything different. It works for them to operate that way. So there's something that we have to do differently as human beings. It works for them, not for us. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. It doesn't work for so, us, it doesn't work for society. Some years ago, uh, like two or three years ago, I had some of my team. She's just in her 30s, uh, millennial from, from Vietnam. Mm. And she said, hey, why this? The first company that I built was a pretty successful big company, 1,200 employees. And she's like, what you guys did? Why you got to grow so big? And that was because we were the first one to put news online for the Mexican market. Yeah. And she was like, what do you mean? And I was like, you used to get your news on the newspaper or the morning news. And then until the night news at six, if something happened in Japan at 2 p.m., like there was no way for you to know. And she was like, but what do you mean? <laughs> like, like she, she grew up just with the internet, having everything on her <laughs> phone. And she couldn't understand that we, we had no option of seeing news, but yeah. just two times a year. Indeed, CNN was the first news channel to be 24 hours and yeah. they were bankrupt for they didn't make money like for 10 years yeah. because even if it was even there, no one wanted to see it. And now everywhere is uh, with the news. So, uh, I, I remember I think we're gonna have to we followed a CNN crisis. Yes. Watching it live in, I don't know, some lounge or some area. And, and that, idea that the I didn't have to wait for the evening news to see what was going on. Now, of course, they followed every detail of this thing in ridiculous uh, so, detail. Uh, I heard what made CNN successful was the first uh, uh, Gulf War, uh, mm-hmm. first attack in Iraq. <laughs> that was the first time people saw TV 24 hours a day because CNN was on site showing yeah. you the attacks 24 yeah. hours a day. Yes. And then yeah. that changed television forever. Yes. And then of yeah. course the internet made it easy, accessible, available. And by the way, we have it on the phone. It it sends you a message. Now it goes to your watch and it's just a mess. Um uh Bill, I, I just uh, got this watch a month ago. I was seeing that you uh were using it. I've been using it for sleep. And the basic the biggest thing for me with the watch is you have these options, like you're in the theater, you're in bed, it's night, whatever. And you tell them not to bother you and be able to let you sleep. Because a mess. That's a thing everyone. that not everybody learns. So I see a lot of young people doing that. And we we certainly had it with our kids where we didn't create the boundaries and the habits. And so all the kids in that group 
will go down to the one that's sort of the least healthy, the least functional. So the one that's got some weird crap going on at three in the morning is going to wake up and engage everyone else who answer. And if you, if that kid's phone is in their hands in their room, they're part of it now. And they end up with weird sleep cycles and, um, and, and, and no ability to, um, like block it off. So I have my phone and watch and that kind of thing set to not bother me in the evening. Like I turn it off. Now, you know, there are probably ways you could get through to me if you're having an emergency, but I really do not want to get pinged and dinged all night long. But but, but that's the issue. So my phone, I tell them, I go to bed at 10. At yeah. 9.15, it prepares, it tells me, hey, 9.15, go to bed so you could start doing your... Uh -huh. your you get that, like... The system or my... my, my yeah. uh, ritual yeah. uh, and by 10 i'm done and yeah. it starts not sending me calls but that's the issue i don't have a phone in my house so my yeah. only phone is my phone and it's yes. turned off yeah. Yeah. automatically at 10 so if there's yeah. an emergency at 2 a.m no yeah. one can do that. the short answer to that is that you can assign a few phones a phone numbers then it can actually get through at whatever time so you know, i imagine you can, you can, i haven't I, yeah. I haven't programmed that like but, my parents, yeah. they're getting old. I would love for them to call me anytime. If there's any emergency exactly. at 2 a.m. Exactly. So you can have their phone number. Uh, and my daughter, my daughter is 16. She's starting boarding school this year. And I want, if she calls me at 2, I want to be able to hear it. I want to be able to react. So, so yes, I need to do that. I haven't done it. Some mix of, of that. Well, you can create exceptions. Like uh, I want to hear from no one except this list or that kind of thing, which I have like my alarm company and my kids and that kind of thing on. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I'll need to ask you to tell me. On the next podcast. <laughs> the next podcast, settings for your phone. <laughs> <laughs> you can be reached at 2 a.m. for an emergency. <laughs> Also, sometimes multiple calls will get through. There's a few things like that that you can configure. But I think figuring out how to manage and protect your boundaries and not answer everything and manage your life um, is critical for you and the people on your teams. Um, learning how to put the phone down uh, when you're in the middle of a conversation and not look at the distractions and that kind of thing. Uh, Warren Rustand reminded me of the importance of doing that, of like, listen, um, if you're coming here to talk with me, don't look at your damn phone. Um, I didn't make that mistake with Warren, but he told me about somebody else who did. So I was sure I was primed not to, uh, <laughs> yeah. not to make that well, I'll, I'll give you an example. So I'm a little bit of a night owl. So I, I tell my team members, uh, if you get a message from me at 10, 11, 1, 2 a.m., don't worry. I don't expect an answer. I don't expect a response. Heck, make sure your phone is off. Uh, but my expectation is not that you're going to respond to it. It's just that that's when I thought of something. Um, yes, Max, and, I have, it, it happens the same thing. And I had discussion with my team and they said, but if you send me a WhatsApp or a message, I just cannot see it. So send me an email if you don't want me to see it. So after yeah, that's hours, kind of bullshit though. That's not actually accurate. That's about how they're set up, but they could turn it off. They can, but they usually don't see their email. Uh, right. Of hours, but right. you do see your text in your phone. Uh, no, nope, I do hours. not. You do not? No, I I do. No, uh, no text, uh, no WhatsApp, no nothing. Generally between uh, between uh, ten p.m. and seven a.m., I see nothing. Um, oh. like except like a call from my kids or my alarm company will get through. That's it. Yeah, that's it. No WhatsApp, no nothing. No slack, no. <laughs> and I, it's funny. So I've now coached uh, three companies through billion dollar valuations and uh, I'm super proud of that. But, uh, you know, bigger is not necessarily better. And in one of those companies, the CEO was trying to be Superman all the time. And they would send uh, like a message at three in the morning to people on their team saying, oh. hey, I've got this idea. I'd like you to have something ready for the staff meeting. The staff meeting was going to be at 9 a.m. So the person would wake up at six or seven or whenever they woke up in the morning and they'd see this 3 a.m. message from the CEO who just effed their whole day and whole world up with some unreasonable request to do something that, you know, there's a time and place to be unreasonable, a time and place where it's magic. But if you if you overuse it like anything, you just are a, a 
I don't know. I don't know the right word. A shit show. Um, you're messing with your team's vibe, their their whole mojo by giving them constant emergencies. Yeah. So it it, it reminds me of a lesson I learned in my corporate days. Um, and the, the idea is simple. You've got to manage your team members and you've got to manage your boss. Yeah. And, and I like to tell mm-hmm. that to, to my, to, you know, to, to, to the teams. Manage because, up. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Uh, set expectations, yeah. have conversations, uh, communicate, right? Because that, that superhero uh, CEO might not realize what's, what, what, what chaos he's causing. But if that person can say, hey, Right. Uh, with with if there's a high level of trust in the organization uh, in between them, they could they could and should come back and say, let's talk about this. Right. Because this is how it's having an impact. Now, if it's if it's that important for you, et cetera, et cetera. Great. I'll wake up at five and, and get it done. But if it yeah. isn't. Right. So manage up and manage down. So that CEO in particular was mm-hmm. not terribly coachable. Um that was a challenge, you know. I think I'm a decent coach, but I was not able to interrupt that. They weren't interested in in uh, oh. trying some new approaches. <laughs> One day, I was hired by a private equity fund to work. <clears throat> they, sorry, with a client, they just invested like thirty million dollars in the company, and they were having a lot of challenges with the CEO. So they said, "Hey, we're going to hire you. You coach the CEO." And we've been probably two or three weeks with the engagement. And I would have dinner to a Japanese, very nice restaurant in Mexico City. And I had the entrepreneur, their number two, and myself, and we're having a conversation. And he said something like, like deeply offensive to his CEO. And his CEO responded. They begin elevating the conversation. They start shouting on the table. And his number two just left the table and left. Mm. And the CEO stayed eating. And I was like, Are you gonna, he's your number two, he's your partner. Like, you're not even going to. Apologize, and the guy said, "No, he he does his drama. He, he'll be quiet. He'll come back tomorrow." And I was like, "He's not coming back tomorrow." <laughs> and the guy said, "Like he's not." I was like, oh, you, "You are deeply offended." And so we had a big conversation. We came out. They continued fighting on the on the parking lot. Um, and he said, "I'm done. I'm never going to come back." And I remember the CEO. I went with him, and I left my car. So he went and dropped me somewhere. And before he dropped me, he said, hey, but we're going to do great, right? And I was like, no, this company, this, I told him, this company is going to be successful because of you, in spite of you. Yeah. Because it's really ugly to work for you. And he yeah. was like, ah, come on, it's not that bad. And I was like, no, it is really bad. <laughs> Every employee that I've talked to in the last couple of weeks hates you. But you paid so much money and you're being so successful that they work for you. But they yeah. hate you. Yeah. And he was kind of quiet. He changed very little. Yes. By the way, the engagement didn't last six months. Ago. Yeah. I think we all have things like that. Uh, and and sometimes your past success, your money is a, a limiting thing. I had a similar conversation with a CEO who, um, the, you know, the company was big. It did good. The product was good in the world. Um, it was successful and powerful in its category. It made lots of money, a gajillion, gajillion dollars, right? Like um, profitable, cash positive, all that kind of thing most of the time. And uh, and the CEO's behaviors were uh, the source of everything that he complained about. And when it became clear and when I pointed it out, he looked irritated and that was the last time we worked together. <laughs> I'm like, well, look, all right. I, it all comes back to this. If you're not willing to shift and try some new things, that we're like, I can't help you anymore. Like, this is all, and it's good news that it's all you, um, because you can change you easier than you can change anybody else. But if you're not willing to sh- share and and shift your approach, and I think what wasn't really said, but what felt like it was theirs. Listen, who the hell are you, Coach Punk? Uh, I, uh, I've grown this company this size and I've got all this money and I'm like, whatever. And, you know, I'm like, okay, but you're stuck here and you've got these complaints. So <laughs> how's that going? <laughs> so I have, I have a rule, um, when, when I work with companies, yeah, I, I don't believe the CEO or the founder or founders of the company could build a great company. Yes. They have to focus on building a great team. Yes. And if they build a great team, the great team is going to build a great company. Yes. If they try to skip the middle. 
not yeah. going to end the world. Yes. You could fake it and you could like through effort and, and push. Yeah. You could do it for some time, nothing in the long term. If you really don't, and by the way, Steve Jobs is one of the most minimizer uh, CEOs we've had. And he knew before he died, he built the university. He knew that the, he needed to leave a space to continue growing the team for Apple to continue being successful. And yes. a lot of people predicted Apple was going to be gone after Steve Jobs. And yeah. that's why there are two trillion dollar company today. Well, you know, we, we opened the show with conversations about Elon. Um, we're talking about Steve Jobs now. A lot of people, a lot of very powerful leaders who accomplish a lot of things are kind of obnoxious. And the stories about Jobs and about Elon uh, in different ways about being obnoxious are legendary. Uh, and yet they did accomplish something. And clearly the culture and the people that uh, Jobs left in place actually did continue and grow and evolve because there were a lot of people who thought well it's he's dead it's done right they're never going to do anything else and they've continued to be a different kind of company than they were under him but evolve like he, he clearly created something is is he the norm or is he the exception i think he's the exception and let me tell you uh, uh two stories quickly one is <clears throat> the other day i was talking with this guy in his 20s and he said i'm not going to finish college and i was like why no. not because if Bill Gates and Steve Jobs didn't finish college, I don't need college. And I was like, yeah, that's for the exception. <laughs> the other 99.99% of the world, college really works for us, right? Yeah. That's not the exception. But yeah. I remember seeing this documentary after Steve Jobs passed, and they were interviewing some of his employees, people that worked directly for him, and saying, like, hey, how was to work with him? Like, expecting all this. He was a luminary and blah, blah. And everyone spoke really badly about working for him. So the reporter, after second or third, said, like, and then why you stayed? If it was so bad, why do you stay? And one said something that I thought it was very profound. He said, Steve Jobs wanted you to be greater than what you think you could be. Mm. So if you resign to working for him, <clears throat> you are resigning to a better you. Yes. And it's very difficult to resign to a better you. So I think he took it to such an extreme that people... When they went to bed, said, yeah, it was a tough day to work for him, but I'm a better human being. I'm having a bigger impact in the world because I'm working for him. And I think that's why he was so effective. Yeah. So when, when you guys look at, at the leaders that you work with, can they be like Steve Jobs in the good ways? And can they be like what we expect from great leaders as well? Right. I say yes, and I can think of a is few it, things, it, but it's it takes work, right? I I um, I coached a woman some years ago um, who was working on something, and and uh, in the middle of uh, or in the beginning of this um, uh, leadership development um, uh, work, she um, had a recurrence of cancer, and was set up for a substantial and difficult uh, series of chemo. And she came to me and she said, listen, I we got to stop our work in this project. We got to stop our coaching work. And I looked at her. I appreciated her world. I, I got her situation. And then I said, no. <laughs> I said, you can't, you, you can't quit. Um, I don't care if you do this from the hospital. Um, I don't care if you're throwing up, if you feel terrible. You can do everything we need to do here with your voice in conversation. So you can do it all by phone if you need to. Um, you could have somebody else do the computer stuff or whatever. But you cannot quit on what we're doing right now. And you cannot quit on our coaching. Um, I say no. You don't get to quit just because you have cancer and because you might die. If you finish this with your last breath, let it be your legacy. Wow. And did she stay and did she survive? She, um, she did complete the whole project. She did complete the coaching series. Um, it was successful. Um, she lived to the end of it. She was surprised. It was difficult. 
Um, she was exhilarated and fulfilled by what she'd accomplished. And uh, she died about a year later um, from the same cancer. Um, but that whole project, that initiative outlived her and continued, I don't know about still to this day, but for some years later, I, I used to hear about it. Um, and I realized that it did matter to her. She was deeply proud of that work and that I had pushed her to do it even when it was reasonable not to do it. It was uncomfortable to do it. And I was really proud of that coaching. And the only thing that I think that made that work, and I think it applies not just for the coaches, but for our CEOs, is if you're having somebody do something that they care about for reasons they care about, you can push people to do something with their dying breath, right? Like, that's okay. If I'm trying to manipulate them to get something done for me, like I'll burn in hell for that. <laughs> but if it's for them, for what they want, and I really know them, I have that room, right? Yeah. It's maybe a little more dramatic than, you know, but, you know like you, that's you, out there. You, you really pushed, you really pushed the, the, the purpose, right? Yeah. And even gave her something, something to focus on because, in a nutshell, you, hel you helped her focus on what really mattered to her. And I'm sure that you, you infused a lot of energy um, yeah. and probably helped her get through those difficult times better because there was something to fight for. So in the course I've been developing on leadership and the book I've been writing on the same aspect of stuff is, is about this thing, the leadership flywheel uh, and a set of core, uh, four core um, disciplines of, of leadership that scales. Um, so we'll be doing that. I'm pretty sure that that the chapter on that coaching stuff will be named after her. <laughs> I will want to acknowledge that because that was a very memorable thing. Hey, I've got one more uh, deep thing before we wrap our show this week. But before we do that, let me um, let me remind folks that um, when, if you are managing a team remotely, if you're trying to keep the team on track um, now more than ever, especially with with these hybrid and remote working things, you've got to get some kind of online scoreboard so that everybody can look at it. You can't just have a whiteboard anymore where you write things down. And so our aligned scoreboard, you can go to scalingup.com slash software and get the uh, scaling up scoreboard the, from Align um, is great. And we continue to develop that. The, the interface, the UI of that's getting better and better and the integration. So now you can integrate that using Zapier or with Salesforce and, uh, and other things to update priorities to, you can integrate some of the metrics and the updating of that scoreboard into some of your other tools so that there's less maintenance involved. But um, anyway, all that and more there. Also, reminder to folks uh, to like, subscribe, to share it. Dan, you want to say something else? Yes, something about uh, scoreboards and the yeah, new please. update. Uh, yeah. By the way, I'm a huge fan, I'm, I'm, and I have to disclose I'm on the board of Align. Yeah. It's a great <laughs> company. They've done great improvements yeah. to the platform. But here's just one thing, and we had the discussion on the board. Uh, we, we, it, we've been requested for many times from teams having this uh, automation or, or connection with Zapier, the API, so or yeah. Zapier, another tool, so we could get data automatic. Yeah. And I think it's huge. It's going to help a lot. Yes. But I want to give one big disclosure. Yes. Um, for me, the priorities, yes. I want the teams to go manually to Manual. look for the data yes. and put it in because yeah. the 15 minutes that they take a week really good updating that helps yeah. them to do how to analyze their week and how yep. to grade how well they're doing and how well they're yep. executing. Yes. So I think it's extremely important that you don't skip that. Um, Searching the data, like picking up the pen to use the whiteboard is important and useful kind of uh, an experience for people rather than having everything automated. So yep. don't have 100% of your dashboards automated. Have a space that every week your teams have to go and look for the data Interact, and yeah. put it in manually and be able yeah. to do the analysis of what that data means. Yes. Lots of lots of ownership, right? In in having to get that number yourself because you own it. It's your it's your yes. number. And yes, and, yes. and 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 playing around with the numbers gives you more insight than this is the outcome. So I'm yes. I'm with you, Daniel, that uh, understanding how you got to that number. 
in our, we have some KPIs, like traffic on the website and stuff that gets automatically uh, into into a line or, or dash or scoreboards. And the priorities, they're all manual. Whenever you have to update your priorities, I want that to be manual mm-hmm. because of that um, um, uh, importance of having to do that analysis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well said. I think it's really important. I remember going to my flight instructor uh, years ago when I was learning to fly and being very excited to show him one of these early flight planning software apps. And I could do it right on my phone at the time. And he's like, that thing's going to get you killed. And let me show you why. And he 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 had me put in some flight path. And he's like, okay, now, uh, would you go fly that? And I'm like, yeah, the thing says I this or that and there's the thing it's all automated it's on the computer the computer knows he said okay now let's go draw it out on the chart and so this was a visual not an instrument flight plan um <laughs> and he had me driving through like an active military training area and into the side of a mountain <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> and he's like yeah, you have to think about where you're going and what you're doing if you over rely on some of these tools you over automate that i had another team that did very very poorly for a while because they spent a lot of money investing in one of these fancy bi systems and they put monitors all over their office with the intel on it and and the the ceo would come from a background where he loved having like his bloomberg terminal and that kind of thing he just loved having these things but i'm like the rest of your team that's just digital wallpaper there's like pretty graphics showing up there, but it's not telling them anything. They're not using it, right? If unless there's an occasion, a prompt, some interaction, it's just it's just wallpaper. Right? So at the growth issue, we have uh, uh, our dashboards in a line for priorities yeah. and stuff. Yes. And we also have some dashboards in Clipfolio for a lot of day-to-day uh-huh. data. And no one was going into them. And then we start sending it by email uh, and integrating them into our Slack so yes. they at least get them every day. Yes. But then I begin asking questions about things and people said, I don't know. And I was like, it's on the dashboard. I said, which dashboard? And I was like, the one you get by email every day at 9 or 3 a.m. And the guys were saying like, no, I, don't I just that. usually get it and delete. So we had to do a <laughs> class teaching them how to read the dashboards and really get information because if not, they don't see it. And now they understand it. Um, well, as an example, um, one big thing, they were really worried about revenue yes. and not gross profit. Yes. So we had goals of revenue and they said, I go to the revenue. And I was like, yeah, but you sold a program that had 10% gross profit. And on the priorities, you had one that had 80% gross profit. That's a big difference. And they yes. were like, no, I got to my revenue. I was like, that doesn't mean anything. What it means is the gross profit. So we will pay for all, all the expenses. Those kind of very small things make a huge difference when you're mm. running a company. Mm. Uh, and that's very important to use on your dashboard mm. Mm. and that they are able to understand them. So you'll mm. take decisions based on that. Mm. Um, uh, we've got uh, one more uh, great topic about suffering, um, why we suffer, how to suffer a little less uh, coming right up. Before we do that, you guys have anything to promote, talk about, want to shout out? We've got growthinstitute.com, any special events or anything, Daniel? So we have uh, a webinar with uh, Kevin Oaks next Thursday, okay. um, uh, Culture Innovation. What yeah. are the 18 things you have to do to renovate your culture? Um, yeah. and he has amazing data on culture. Uh, and he's going to share a lot of great data. So we have that next Thursday. You could register at growthisu.com. And then we have Culture Innovation. And after that, we're going to have uh, Scaling Up uh, Master Business Course. But here's the most important thing we're doing this year. Um, mm. We're doing private universities for companies. So mm. companies say, hey, just give me access to everything. And mm-hmm. because the way we work with our leaders, we were, the way we pay them, we couldn't give people access to everything. Mm. Now we have uh, access to that. So we mm. get companies that starting at 1500 a month, they could have their own private university with people like Vern Harnish, Salim Ishmael, Pir Damandis, uh, Brad Smart, and the rest to be able to train and grow their team. Uh, it's an amazing program. Uh, we already have some companies going through it. And and if you want to build your own private university to scale your business with the best faculty in the world, give us a call. We'll be happy to, to put something that is uh, tailored for you and your company. Nice. And Max? Excellent. 
Um, well, right now, uh, I've got I've got a project that's on the works, but um, maybe you have me back uh, in a few months, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. Secret, still in stealth mode. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll tell you just a little bit about it. So we've we've been working with um, the veterinarian field, and we we've really kind of adapted scaling up to help um, animal hospitals, veterinarian practices. So um, soon. Uh, we're going to be opening up our doors to the the premier practice, um, where we're going to use you know all of these technologies to to help um, these uh, the doctors grow and scale. Interesting, interesting. We got a couple veterinary companies related uh, businesses go through our accelerator program, and I did a little bit of coaching with a grooming business. We had a mobile surgery uh, go through. So, yeah, we've had a few that have been like that. It's, um, it's a very I'll, exciting industry. I'll send you a text. Um, I have a client in Canada um, that needs some help with that. Excellent. Cool. Happy to help. Yeah. A uh, reminder that we've got uh, about 300 shows now in our back catalog. So many of the people that we've talked about before, we've had Kai and Kreppendorf on. We've had others on. Uh, we've talked about exponential organizations, about scoreboards, about uh, various aspects of leadership and so on. All that and more, that whole back catalog um, of uh, podcast episodes at scalingcoach.com. So you'll find all that there. Of course, you can like, subscribe, thumb up. Uh, and get them in wherever you get your podcast content and uh, or you can do it on our own website at scalingcoach.com. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us or give us some feedback or get help finding a coach, info at scalingcoach.com is the email. Um, so our, um, our last topic, I think, is one of the more important ones, and that is about the source of suffering, why we suffer. There's a new video out. Michael Singer's put out one, author of Untethered Soul and the Surrender Experiment, um, one of our thought leaders in the world of well-being and leadership. Um, and he's got a, a video out about the dangers of our mind, uh, both the gift on the one hand and the danger on the other hand of what goes on within our own heads and how it can both help us and get us in trouble. Um, and I think it's really beautiful. I, I try to remind myself that that pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. And sometimes that doesn't seem to help me enough. <laughs> I'm going through something. <laughs> but so, so when, um, and by the way, I haven't seen that video, but I've studied some with Michael Singer, and and it, I come back to um, um, uh, Ryan Holiday that he said the obstacle is the way. As mm -hmm. human beings, mm -hmm. um, entrepreneurs, the best entrepreneurs I've learned from, said the time when they grew the most was with their biggest failures. Um, and, leaning into uh, it. Yeah. Leaning into it, correct. And then Lean In, uh, uh, the book uh, with Charles Zamberg. Uh, and also, uh, like in selling, the first time I heard this about selling, people said, hey, you start selling when you get the first objection of your client. And I'm like, no, objections when they're saying no. That, that means they already started thinking about it. Yes. Before an objection is done, nah, 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 they, they kind of disregard until they get the first objection, that's when they really start internalizing the process. So that's where the, the, the selling start. Um, I do a podcast for EO, uh, to organization in Spanish. And my first question is, give me your favorite failure because we mm. all have a failure that made us who we are today. Mm. So, so that's part of human connection and condition. Mm -hmm. We have to suffer and that's a great, mm -hmm. just the mm -hmm. way we learn. I really, I really appreciate this subject. Some, it's actually something I, I've studied a little bit, uh, and I really like Michael Singer. Um, so, so to me, there's there's a couple of people that really go deep into that subject, uh, anywhere from uh, Krishnamurti or Eckhart Tolle. But Michael Singer communicates in a language we can all understand, right? Because it, you know, you're talking about going a little into the deep end. But I believe that um, most of our pain. <laughs> comes from expectations, mm. right? We have a view of how things should be. And then reality doesn't match that vision of how things should be. And then we get frustrated, angry, or upset, right? So, so um, you know, I have a little bit of OCD and I've been able to manage it throughout the years. One of the things that happens with this OCD is that you get, you get an idea of how you want the world to be, 
or to look like, or people to act, or the food to taste, or to look. And then when it doesn't match that paradigm, you 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 get you get you get frustrated, you get upset. Uh, you want to do something about it. So learning to be be clear about the outcomes that you want, not how things need to look. And in a typical example I see with with entrepreneurs, uh, usually the ones that are stuck, is where they've been the ones carrying all the weight, and they, you know they're the they're the Steve Jobs of the world that they have a perfect idea of how things need to look. And then when a different team member does it, and it doesn't look like that, they discard it. It's wrong. It's not going to work. I don't like it. Mm-hmm. Versus saying, will it get the outcome? It might get the outcome in a different way than I had envisioned it, but will it get the outcome? And being open to that. So focusing a little bit less on the exactly how things need to look and a little bit more on, on letting things uh, flow and, and getting the outcomes that you really are looking for and, and realizing what matters and what doesn't, right? Mm-hmm. So if, if, you, if you're expecting a project, a meal or something a certain way, and it's not exactly that, does it really matter, right? What's the impact that it's going to have? And if it's not going to be significant, then you got to let go of those expectations and be, and be comfortable with those outcomes. So um, very specifically for me, it has been, it has been helpful um, to set less specific expectations on little things and have better expectations of bigger outcomes. And then I think it facilitates what Daniel and Bill, you were saying about uh, learning from those failures um, because you, you, you know that they are just working you towards those outcomes. So that's, that's a little bit about kind of what, 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 what has made me suffer throughout the years and how I work out of that. Yeah, I hear in what you're saying, I'm reminded by both what you said and what Daniel said, that for me, the the source of the suffering is resisting the way things actually are, resisting the present reality that I'm not digging, or the expectation of where the interpretation of the reality that I have, um, that that whole thing is the suffering. And then, as as Daniel said, leaning into and and Max, you said noticing your fixation on um, some expectation, all of that gets in the way. You actually lean into what's going on and even your interpretation of what's going on. And uh, and then the suffering becomes an interesting challenge. We choose the present reality or we accept it and things begin to shift for us, right? By the way, if you remember the drama triangle, Yes. Uh, the main thing that goes from a problem to a challenge is yes. we all could be uh, creators or victims. Uh, the difference a victim said, I don't have the power or the tools to fix something. So it's a problem. Yes. Yes. If you yes. have the power, then it's a challenge. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so the best thing is how can you are going to get your mindset to be a challenge? Yes. And yes, there could be some suffering in the process, but that will help you do the change that will help you change from a victim to a creator and be able to do something about it. Mm. Well, I'm grateful to you guys for coming on the show and having a a great conversation on a weekend morning with us as we record this. I want to give big thanks to Lucy Summers working behind the scenes, making our show happen, scheduling, preparing all the production and to Vern Harnish, author and creator of our scaling up framework that we're all uh, grateful to. Our audio for the show is edited by Albert Burge at Podfly Productions. Our show notes are written up by Ayn Kadena and then proofread by Tim McGowan. I want to thank everyone for listening and watching. Thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you again next time. Keep scaling up. Bye.